dust dirt bikes. The basics. Um, the purpose of the dirt bike is for physical fitness, agility, and fun. For most people, some people do it for pro, for money. Uh, they can make a lot of money at it. Um, it's just like a NFL sport. I mean, they make just as much money as they do. Um, so what is a dirt bike capable of? So a dirt bike uh, is mostly capable of off-road technical, uh, most speed, and uphill riding. This is called Durocross, and then there's motocross, and supercross, which is rhythm, uh, jumps, and corners. So riders and skill levels, uh, sizes of CC uh, can vary within riders. Uh, so the CC is measured by cubic centimeters for the motor, the motor. Uh, that's just kind of the number behind each bike. Um, com uh, brands and costs, uh, brands that uh, have made dirt bikes over the years that are well known are mostly all Japanese companies overseas that they haven't shipped over here over the years as riders. Uh, the sport has gained uh, at the moment here. Uh, so some of the companies are Honda, Suzuki, uh, Kawasaki, KTM, Yamaha, Husky or Husqvarna, Gas Gas, Shirko, and a few other sister companies that you mostly see overseas that never come up here. Um, and some of the costs, uh, a brand new bike can cost something for $12,000. Uh, that's probably top of line, everything you want. Uh, most pro racers use $12,000 bikes. Uh, the common motocross uh, brand new bike uh, will be right in the neighborhood of $8,000 uh, in the dealership. And then you know, you scroll to Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist and get a bike for $500 and fix it up to make it into that average $2,000, uh, $3,000 range for a bike. So, introducing the bikes um, this one here is a 2000 Honda Sierra 250R. This is a large frame class uh, motocross bike. Uh, this would be the race bike for 2000. The Honda would have had out, uh, the Pro Rider would have rode this bike uh, for the 250 class, motocross, and supercross. Uh, the common MSRP for the public for this bike here, uh, back in 2000, I used the inflation calculator for the 250 cost nowadays, and I deflated the price to somewhere they put a $5,500 uh, using that $8,000 price. Um, this one here. 2002 on the CR80. This is the super mini uh, class of motocross. So kids, you know, from anywhere from 10 to 13 will ride this bike in um, uh, supercross or motocross. So the prototype for the 250, uh, which would be this bike here, uh, was produced in 1971, the CR250 mold. Uh, the prototype was made in 1971, and then in 1972 they uh, released the 1974 model to the public, uh, which was very similar to this bike. They didn't change much from the prototype. Um, they used the CR250 mold for 37 consecutive years until discontinued in 2007, and that's the same with the CR80. Uh, they discontinued all two stroke production bikes in 2007. Uh, Sriracha so Honda, uh, the creator of Honda, he did not like two strokes, he despised them, and he thought they were dirty and bad for the environment. He back in the day. Uh, so they didn't really like making the bikes, so they were kind of late to the game, but they turned out to make some of the best, uh, fastest uh, two-stroke motocross bikes that were ever made. Uh, this bike here, uh, it's been there a few, changed, a few changes since 1980 uh, when it was produced, uh, the first bike was produced. Uh, it started as an air-cooled uh, power valve motor that changed in 2003 to a CR85 and then it in 2007. Uh, both bikes I bought off of Facebook Marketplace and Yamaha Prime. So on to the two-stroke motor. Um, both of these are two-strokes. I prefer two-strokes. It's the kind of controversial thing between two-strokes and four-strokes. So uh, both of these bikes use the combination of mixing gas and oil, uh, using a carburetor and using a free valve to control uh, fuel intake. Uh, newer bikes nowadays use oil injection and fuel injection. Uh, it's a little cleaner. Uh, passes emissions. So the carburetor would start, this side is the intake, air filter, the carburetor reads, and then fuel comes down in and it mixes it together. And that's kind of what the carburetor does. So for cooling, uh, both of these bikes are liquid cooled. Some of the older ones were air cooled, which air cooled would be just these fins. The liquid cooled would have these jackets, and these water jet and water pump will circulate uh, from the radiators right here to catch air. 
sole, the exhaust management, the expansion chamber, the big noticeable pipe on the bike rather than you know seeing if you've ever seen any other dirt bike, something have a smaller pipe. With the two strokes just a big expansion chamber. This is used uh, to, to maintain exhaust gases in here, which help pressurize the cylinder, which creates more power. Uh, it doesn't release all the gas, so it is able to build up and go back into the cylinder. There's a bunch of electrical or science behind it uh, that I didn't understand, but I, I checked it out and I did not want to put it in here. There's a lot. Uh, so it also uses exhaust valves, um, and the exhaust valves manage the amount of exhaust that is uh, put into the expansion chamber. Uh, at low RPM, the exhaust valve will stay closed to maintain compression. Um, so when it's open, wide open, uh, it will help build compression and release it to the expansion chamber for the exhaust gases. Uh, silencers, which are these back here, this other part, um, it, they can change uh, if you're in the woods. Uh, you need a spark arrestor to pass the EPA standards for the um, for uh, force fires. Uh, you can, they have a spark arrestor ones and for sound, noise, for the supercross, because when it's, uh, supercross are in like indoor football fields, so they have to pass a certain noise standard, especially back in the day, too, when they ran strictly. So the average weight of each bike, uh, this bike here is around 215 pounds dry, that's without any fluids. Uh, that bike is something that weighs around 150 pounds. And it hasn't changed since 2000. A lot of them keep around that 250 pound range. A lot of riders like that weight. They didn't want to go any lighter. They didn't obviously didn't want it any heavier. But a lot of the older bikes were quite a bit more than that. They had to be uh, a lot stronger to weigh them around and such. So. Uh, the uh, two strokes uh, fluid containment. Um, in here is a separate area for fluid. This would be gear oil or like your transmission oil in your car. This would be either ATF automatic transmission fluid or 8090 weight gear oil to do the clutch, the kickstart gear, and the transmission. Um, then obviously you mix your gas and oil. So you mix a 32 to 1, which is 4 ounces of oil to 1 gallon of gas. Uh, you mix that, and that's what burns. Not, it's kind of frowned upon these days uh, because of pollution and such, but and that's kind of why it's such companies discontinue them. But they're still being made, and they're still being made cleaner and better, so they don't they aren't um, polluting as much. So the average cost on the market today is right around that eight thousand dollar range for a two-stroke. I mean, they're all about the same between two-stroke and four-stroke for a new bike today. Not very many companies make them, so you have to be pretty specific, and you're kind of just set to one company. You can't really choose. So Honda, Suzuki, and half of Kawasaki discontinued their bikes in 2007 with the two-stroke models. Uh, Kawasaki still makes the 85 to 65 and 100 two-strokes, uh, which is all part of the Super Mini class for kids. So they still have a powerful bike and still competitive class of racing. So some of the history behind the two-stroke motor, it started with motocross air-cooled, went to motocross liquid-cooled, and in the 80s they had a mechanical power valve, and then early 2000s, they got the electronic power valve with the servo motor, and then there was obviously these days oil injection and fuel injection uh, to pass in these standards. So moving on to four stroke, um, four strokes are pretty much everywhere now. They, I mean, it's, it's more desirable. The engine uh, lifespan is, is a lot longer as well. Um, what you add, uh, the difference from a two stroke what you add is the valve. So uh, I said on the two stroke, the expansion chamber controls the exhaust gases. Well, this would put the exhaust valve over here would control the amount of exhaust gases in the motor. And then the uh, intake valve would control the air and fuel intake into the motor. And when you're talking about fuel injected, it just injects fuel into here rather than using it, um, rather than using the carburetor. So this would be all called the valve treatment. And it's all timed together from the crank so it all fires. It's the same as in your, in your, in your cars as you used to. So cooling is pretty much the same throughout all bikes. It's liquid cooled mostly, and they used to have air cooled back in the day. Uh, some of the smaller bikes now will still be air cooled, but most of them are now. Maybe that technology is a little easier to make water jets in the cylinder and such. And water pumps a little bit better, so the bikes stay cool. Um, so uh, piston ring life, valve train life, um, two strokes can last somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 hours. Uh, if you ride in the woods, you ride it easier with a weekend rider. Uh, it can last right around 100 hours. Uh, if you ride them racing, wide open everywhere, you ride around 20 hours, it changes to the top end, which is the 
this and the piston, the rings, and then sometimes the cylinder probably having two different pistons because everything all wears a lot of friction in two strokes rather than four strokes. Um, so there's just the differences there. Um, so the maintenance on four stroke, rather than replacing a bunch of different fluids or having to worry about a bunch of different fluids, you just have your engine oil. So just like the car, your engine oil and then your oil filter. Uh, that's all you have to change to maintain the four stroke. But a four stroke lifespan, it could be somewhere in the neighborhood about 200 hours. Uh, uh, if you ride it in the woods, you ride it a little easier, not so hard on it. But wide open, they'll replace them every 50 or less hours, uh, depending on how hard they work. So um, the weight uh, varies, stays right around as much as this one. If not, they got a little lighter over time. Uh, they, they, uh, stronger alloys are used, and it's cheaper to get these metals, so they aren't using just straight aluminum and trying to make it as thick as possible to be strong. Um, so the fluid containment, uh, you obviously have your engine oil, coolant, and then your fuel. And that's all you have for fluid and a four-stroke on a cross bike. And all uh, companies that listed before still make four-strokes and will probably continue making four-strokes. So benefits of aftermarket parts. Um, starting, the first thing that I feel is most important is your suspension. This is your ride, this is your control. It'll fatigue you if your suspension is poor. It'll whip you around and you won't be able to maintain, uh, maintain being seated on the bike, which uh, is very important for speed, especially during racing uh, and stuff like that. So you have your shock, your shock and then your linkage, all, this, all these bearings in here can go bad and stuff. It'll, it'll throw you around as you hit stuff. And then your forks here, this is all fluid filled in here and pressurized by the fluid, so it has rebound. So uh, to, lighten, to lighten bikes, a lot of times they will make carbon fiber or use alloy of metals such as billet aluminum to make bikes lighter. You're obviously not going to shave off 100 pounds, but it'll make the bike lighter, make the rider feel more comfortable on the bike, and some of these parts do make the bike look a little better as well. Um, so uh, power Torque low and high is kind of sometimes it's a difficult uh, theory to understand, but torque low means your, your zero throttle to about half throttle is your low end torque. I mean, woods riders and girl riders want a lot of uh, low end torque because obviously they're not going super fast in the woods, so they want that low end torque um, to be able to ride slower. Uh, and then obviously motocross racers want all that top end or high torque um, so they can keep it wide open and have all the power they need to go as fast as they can to crowd over jumps and such. Um, so uh, handling comfort, uh, when I think of handling comfort, to me, your seating position on the bike, you get where you feel comfortable, and then anything your hands and your feet touch are all things that can be adjusted uh, to help your comfortability, to make you feel like you're not cramped on the bike, to feel like you can maneuver the bike, uh, you can roll the bars forward, you can uh, roll your throttle forward so when you're open you're at a comfortable angle. You can twist these up and down, up, twist, twist your uh, levers up and down so you, you, it feels more comfortable to grab when you need to. You can move your clutch lever to the end so you have more leverage on it. If it's harder to pull, you can adjust the height of both your shifter and your brake lever. You can obviously get wider foot pegs to make it feel more comfortable so it's not just on the wall or on the center of your foot. It's just all to help with comfort and maybe make you a little faster if you want. So tires, um, I have two different tires on both of these bikes. Um, this is what's called a cheater. Uh, this would be a lot more knobs for woods riding, so you get maximum traction. And then this bike over here would have the motocross tires. They're a little smoother, so you're able to whip around the corner and still have some wheel spin. That'll help you out um, to get around the corner a little faster. So repair and ride styles, obviously supercross and motocross. Uh, supercross, like I said before, is in uh, like a, like take the UV dome for example. It's just a bunch of dirt in there and it's, it's a lot of short rhythm sections, not going super fast. And then motocross is a couple acres of land where you can go wide open. There's a lot, a uh, lot less jumps and just a little more speed involved with it. Um, so they'll have in pro supercross and motocross, you'll have trackside mechanics. You know, the, the companies such as Honda would hire mechanics to work on the bikes for the rider, and the, hire, the rider would be hired by Honda to ride their bike and kind of, I guess, it, it, I would say advertise it. Um, so, amateur business sponsor, that'd be like a uh, local motocross track, might, business might sponsor 
the rider, uh, give them a bike, and then maybe a mechanic from their business uh, just to kind of promote their business and maybe help the rider uh, go pro. That's kind of how they would get pro. Um, so they would have trackside volunteer tags or the business response to that. So then there's the weekend warrior and me. Uh, would ride the bikes on the weekends and then, you know, fix them during the week and kind of budget, find parts and, and use, you know, the internet, YouTube and forums to kind of repair what I can and you know, try and find people to help me out. So just, it's, the, the weekend warrior is kind of what I, where I place myself at. So for my mentor experiment, uh, I used, uh, or I asked Scott Blockus to help me out. He has a lot of mini bikes and has a lot of experience in their bikes. He used to work at Caterpillar. Uh, so he, has a, he knows his way around the motor and he showed me a few things about tools and such that uh, the information I took that for when I work on my next bike that I'll feel a lot more comfortable using and maybe I'll have a little more knowledge to take with me. So why I picked this topic, uh, I picked this topic for, love of dirt, for my love of dirt bikes. I've loved dirt bikes since I was a little boy and never really had the chance the opportunity to buy them now that I've worked really hard to get where I'm at. And, buying and selling bikes and learning how to fix them and stuff. I feel like it's a lot of knowledge I can take with me over the course of my life. And I'm super proud of what I have and uh, what I've built. Both of these bikes I've tore down every nut and bolt just so I feel confident knowing what each part does and how it works so I can repair it after I ride it. Uh, my passion for repair, I repair anything with a motor. I love working on it, tinkering with it, knowing how it works that, that interests me the most. Um, my appreciation for motors and their advancements over the years, from when the first motor was built till now, is just it's fascinating for me to see how they've changed and made them better. And my obsession with Honda dirt bikes, I mean, these are my favorites, so I figured I'd bring these in. This is my obsession with them. So. Uh, thank you, hope you enjoyed it. Is there any questions? Clearly a Honda man. I've, yeah, I've had all brands, but uh, Honda I've found is probably the best, okay. in my opinion. Cool. And have you, you mentioned customizing for Angelina Comfort. Have you done that to these for you specifically? Yes, when I got these, these bars were set up for wood, so they were really high, so the rider could stand up while mm -hmm. he's riding. And I put these motocross bars on, they're a little wider, easier to, uh, you feel, when your hands are out wider, you have more control, especially when you get head shake and stuff, and you go a little faster. Uh, I've changed. Uh, these have gotten a little bigger. The stock ones were kind of small, and they, it's easier to put your motocross boot on. This is a motocross boot. When you have it on, you don't really feel much because of how thick it is because of the padding. So you make these a little bigger. It's easier to feel. And that bike I just kind of made as original as possible. I didn't really mess with too much handling comfort. Just rolled the bars for it to my comfort. So. What's your uh, What's your next goal? Well, where do, do you see this taking you? On this last lap here, uh, that's a brand new 2021 CRF 250R. I'm trying to buy and sell bikes so I can get a little money, enough to hopefully put a down payment on that. So that's kind of the end goal in my eyes. It's just for fun for me, so I don't really have any other goals to get that bike. So. <laughs> Sometimes the bomb and me goes safety first. <laughs> yeah, I talk to me about it. <laughs> I wear a helmet all the time, a lot of times for noise, but as my mom would tell me to, it's safety. Yeah. Uh, wear a helmet, goggles, boots. Uh, the only time I'd really wear boots is just because I can't start this thing in a tennis shoe a lot of times when it's cold. So I wear boots and then gloves, and then uh, if I was going to go to the racetrack, I'd get a chest protector. And and stuff like that if I did any bigger jumps, but I'm not there yet, so. Sure. Yeah, that's awesome. I, uh, so where do you feel like if somebody were to start, where would be a good place to start? Obviously buying a bike yeah. is a good start, but after that, what would, I would you say? say? I would say uh, go on YouTube, internet, search for, search for different things that uh, different reviews. There's so many reviews out there about bikes and brands and uh, tools and what you all need and so many people is, that are so helpful and will explain how to do stuff. Like I went in this knowing, having no mechanical knowledge whatsoever about anything. Uh, but I just took a dirt bike, just started taking nuts and bolts off, understanding how it is or how it's put together and just having an interest for how things work definitely helps you out. 
How many have you owned and sold? I've owned myself probably close to 12 now. Oh. Uh, being that I probably started about 12 years old, give or take. Uh, sometimes I keep them, sometimes mm -hmm. I get bored of them, and then I sell them, and then I find something else in the project. Uh, that, that bike there was actually my winter project. I bought that bike for six, 600 bucks, now I'm running and completely took it down and re redid everything. I mean, nothing will get polished and clean and such, so I try to make it as original as possible. And that one will probably get resold, but this one, I don't think I'll get rid of this one. So. so, what's your plans after graduation? So, I uh, got accepted to Hawkeye Community College for welding. Hopefully, going to either work in like Kinsey Manufacturing or out of the manufacturing for welding, and then or either go to the pipeline or well, gas mains and stuff. Not a mechanic. Not not a mechanic. I think I just view it as a hobby. I don't think I want to be a mechanic. I think I'd be sick of that. Sure. Just work on strictly dirt bikes, and that's it. Very good. <laughs> I'm done with questions. How often do you